the only difference is they are now going to put it into one room. Will this make it more efficient? I don't think so. Will they become smarter? I don't think so. But all it does is that instead of different, different rooms where all these different agencies used to walk in and do stuff, they will now all be sitting in one particular place. So don't get too alarmed by CMS. It's a bad concept, but this is essentially what is doing. So to some of the, uh, one of the questions that uh, Pranesh raised, that is this about politics? I said, no, it's actually about incompetence. We are not a very competent nation, and that also reflects in the way we conduct our business. And therefore, because of its incompetencies, one thing after the other is piled on. For example, he raised the issue of Amar Singh. Now, Amar Singh was never put under surveillance. Amar Singh was backstabbed by a corporate group he seemed to be close to, who illegally recorded his conversations, and has nothing to do with the surveillance regime. The Arun Jaitley case, which is recently in the news, is a failure of the existing infrastructure, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Now, Pranesh also raised this issue about 90,000 or how many thousand in Gujarat. None of them were illegal, by the way. As the current legal uh, infrastructure, I mean, structure that is concerned, what the Gujarat government and the DJP has said is that he is concerned at the number of requests and for frivolous reasons that have been put in. But, and this is a note for all of you, all these requests were done perfectly legally. That speaks volumes about how weak our legal structure is when it comes to monitoring and surveillance and how you as citizens have very little rights. Now, for example, to start with, how does the surveillance regime and especially cyber intelligence, snooping, etc. work? You see, in uh, Bombay, there is a, uh, you, you, you've had optic uh, undersea cables which come in across continents, which were laid a few de decades ago, and this is how we now uh, have communication, international communication. Now, in Malar, there is a place which is the receiving station where all these cables come in and etc. Now, from there, a parallel cable has been drawn to a NTRO Oblique Intelligence Bureau facility in Kala Ghoda in Bombay, which is near a place in Bombay called Kala Ghoda, where all the data is a mirror image is presented there. As a result, they are, they, if they want, they can try and access, and if the technology, if they have the technological capabilities, try, at least in theory, try and see everything that they want to see. Now, where did they pick up this uh, knowledge from? They didn't reinvent it. They, they picked it up from the National Security Agency of America, which after 9-11 was doing exactly the same thing. Because companies like AT&T, which are the telecom giants, very happily gave access to the National Security Agency. One or two small companies stood up to the, uh, uh, to the American government and to the National Security Agency. But AT&T just opened up their doors, gave them every facility, and AT&T and other major telecom companies helped conduct a lot of surveillance, etc. Et now that is a serious issue, and your telecom companies are now allowing the government not only to snoop at this kind of communication in India, but also in certain foreign countries, which I shall not reveal where. Now, uh, little bit has been said about uh, this Northeast issue. Now, I've done a little bit of an investigation into this, and everybody jumped and said, this is because of social media. Somebody posted something on Facebook, and somebody posted something on Twitter, and therefore people started running away scared, and apparently Bangalore was. Now, this is where the incompetency of our system comes in. Everybody just looked at social media. Nobody looked at the Ministry of Railways. So I went back to the railways, and I asked them, on which day did you sanction the special train to take people from Bangalore and Bombay back to the Northeast. And who gave the order? Now, if you start looking at this incident from the Ministry of Railways, and all of you must be wondering, what has the Ministry of Railways got to do with cyber security and surveillance and snooping and stuff like that? Well, the answer is, the panic was not created by something put up on Facebook or something put up on Twitter. The panic was started because somebody in the Intelligence Bureau in the Ministry of Home Affairs suddenly saw all this panicked and said, let's start putting our trains so that we can pick up these people and take them back home. And the order was passed down to the railway ministry, who immediately sanctioned so many of these trains. And the whole blame has now fallen on the social media for spreading this panic. The panic was not spread, and I filed some RTIs. And after a long time, we managed to get the replies from the Ministry of Railways on who actually gave the orders and on which dates they sanctioned the special trains. 
So when the government of India comes up and says that, look, there is a problem, we have got special trains for you, what will people do? Obviously, they'll panic and get into those trains and go back home. So this is the truth of what actually happened. And based on that, because of one incompetent move, they complicated that incompetent move by then trying to, you know, ban so many Twitter handles and so on and so forth. And there again, what they did was, since Twitter was not accepting their request, they just, you know, created some sort of a uh, diversionary tactic where every traffic, every time you would try to access that, they would, it would get taken to a null site, which anyway did not have any data. So that is the extent of their technological prowess in trying to block something. And when that happened, it just... I mean, if Pranesh were to tweet something, even criticizing this, they were so stupid, the filters were so silly in, in some of the agencies which are supposed to do it, they would end up having blocked Pranesh as well. Which actually happened. Innocent people, a journalist, an editor somewhere, suddenly they were finding their Twitter accounts blocked and all. So this is the level of competency of surveillance, which, is to, which brings us to two things. One, it's bad surveillance, and B, it's bad for intelligence as well. So which brings me to, the next point, that uh, my personal experience, I mean, one day I find three people from the Intelligence Bureau uh, tailing me. I ignored them, gave, managed to slip them off. The next day, I find again the same people tailing me and so on and so forth. When, uh, now, Mr. Tanakar and his group have their intelligence network, the journalists I, was, I discovered that day also have their brilliant intelligence network, and within 15 minutes, everybody knew who had given what orders to whom and so on and so forth. So one gentleman called Mr. Saman Goel, who's our uh, officer in draw officer in London now, uh, had suddenly got orders from Mr. Tarakan's successor saying that this man has been writing so much about draw, he knows too much about us, we need to find out who is. And since he didn't have the manpower, he asked his counterpart in the intelligence bureau to do it. So those people wearing the same shirt, wearing the in the same car, had happily started pushing him. So I managed to call up the cops. The cops came and arrested, I mean, detained them. And then suddenly these guys started posting, they look, we are from the intelligence bureau. Now the cops suddenly became suspicious about me, saying that, look, if the IB is chasing you, then you must be the guilty partner. So luckily I had my photojournalist who took lots of pictures that day to record the incident. But the point is, now this is a major flaw that you have to look at it from a legal perspective. That moment you're put under surveillance for right, for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, then you are immediately expected to be guilty until you are proven innocent, which is completely against. See, this is what happens when you are put under surveillance. I will ignore that for a bit. Uh, that when you are put under surveillance, you are immediately proved to be guilty until an infrastructure comes or a legal regime comes in and proves you innocent, which in this case you can't do because you won't even know you've been put under surveillance. So that's a major <coughs> issue that you have to look. And unlike, say, America or even in Britain, which have enacted laws, in our country, the Home Secretary is supposed to act like a judicial officer because in uh, whether it is in uh, the United States or whether it is in the UK, these are the only two countries I know of and their surveillance regime systems, you at least have to go to a court for wiretapping. And correct me or if I'm wrong on this one. You have to at least go to a court. But in this country, it's, it's a bureaucrat who decides whether you can be put under surveillance or not. Now, uh, I've been reading Maria, Maria's, uh, some of her posts, etc. Now, she's mentioned a little bit about the companies which are doing into surveillance and all, and she's actually based out on the, the main company which supplies internet monitoring systems, which is based out of Bangalore. It's a company called Palladian Systems, who sold the first internet monitoring system to the research and analysis wing and later on NTRO for about 8 crores. So that company is sitting here in your city, creating these kind of uh, systems, which will monitor everything that you are doing. So that's another level of uh, monitoring that is going on. Now, what do these people do? They have set up, they first set it up in six cities. Delhi being one of them, Bangalore being another, Tiruvananthapuram, etc. And later on, suddenly the then National Security Advisor, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Narayan. Narayanan felt that no, there were two other cities, one was Lucknow and I think Hyderabad, which he included, so it turned into eight cities which will do actual gateway monitoring and so on and so forth of the internet, because he felt these were Muslim majority cities or Muslim intensive cities, and therefore the system became so on and so forth. So these are the strange kind of uh, understanding which comes in when we conduct intelligence gathering and surveillance and so on and so forth. Now, 
what is the background? We have picked up a lot of this from, from the British. But look at what the British have done, and again, here's an answer to what Mr. Tarakan has said. They, that the British themselves realized the mistake of not enacting enough laws and legislation to look after your intelligence agencies. So, which is why as lawyers you must understand how these intelligence agencies work because of your whole legal work will start once you understand how they work. And, and in, in Great Britain, all the three major agencies, which is the security service, which is equivalent to our intelligence bureau, which is internal security, popularly called MI5, in 1989 they passed an act called the Security Act of 1989, which now ensures that they are responsible to parliament. In 1994, MI6, which is popularly known, but is actually called the Secret Intelligence Service, SIS, they were made a part, they were enacted through a law called the Intelligence Services Act 1994, as well as GCHQ, General Communication Headquarters, which is equivalent to NTRO or the National Security Agency, which also came under that. But the British government was still not happy, so they went ahead and created another act called the Regulation of Investigative Powers Act 2000 which then said that under what circumstances you can wiretap or uh, intercept communication and so on and so forth. And they also created a parliamentary monitoring committee to look at all this, which is not happening at all in this country. To start with, if you go back to the Constitution of India, and if you look at item number 8 in Schedule 7, it states that a central intelligence bureau will be created by an act of parliament. And yet, no such act of parliament was ever created. Mr. Tarakan's old agency was created by an executive decision. NTRO was again created by an executive decision. Ask the government for those notifications under RTI and they say, no, we will not even share that with you. Now, so what is the safeguard against surveillance? Ironically, technology is the only safeguard against surveillance. Ironically, technology and the incompetence of our intelligence services right now is the only safeguard that we have against our lives being snooped at and so on and so forth. As I said, CMS, NADGRID, etc. <coughs> Honestly, right now, at this point, I'm not so sure whether they are good or whether they are bad. I'll tell you why. See, right now, as, as, as my case shows, no law was followed when I was put under service. And no law is actually followed when somebody decides, some sitting in some uh, government office to put you under service. But when you have these agencies, NADGRID and so on and so forth, you at least have a structure through which they will be forced to come to you and go through those procedures. But then again, what is your and my uh, protection against that? In America, I believe at least there is some disclosure where people will then have to be told that, look, you were put under surveillance. Because if the case goes to court, then at least some of this can be used as evidentiary value. In this country, a whole lot of surveillance will be done, but it will not even show up as evidence in a court of law because it is uh, not supposed to be put under law. For example, Neera Radia, her case would have never come up if we had not published those tapes. And once we published those tapes, she came to know for the first time that she was under service. Of course, a whole new uh, thing together. Finally, uh, as I said, uh, there are certain issues about certain laws. Now, certain for many years have been posting key look, we have. You, you've heard, you've saw those presentations in the morning where they're saying that our critical infrastructure is in danger, this is happening, that is happening. First of all, where is the evidence? Where is the evidence? You want to see evidence, look what the Russians did to Georgia. They start, shut down the country for three days. That is the kind of evidence that you should be looking for. No such major attacks have taken place, one. Second, you have to understand many times certain gives reports about, you know, so many people have been hacked, hacked, hacked. What they do is they go to MTNL and they look at the logs and they say this person accessed, somebody accessed this mail from abroad. They don't even make the effort to figure out whether that person was abroad at that time when they logged into the system. So this is the kind of reporting that certain does and in the absence of any external audit, in the absence of any external checks and balances, in the absence of any proper law, they just go about doing anything that they want and once they create this infrastructure, you end up showing that you know, there is a huge problem, so we have to do something about it. Now, this is my last point. Okay, my last point. <laughs> this is where you also need to be wary about the industry. For example, just Google a name called Kobe Alexander and this company Converse and the subsequent successor called Verit. Now, these are companies which make billions of dollars selling surveillance equipment of all sorts to countries once a picture was painted that a huge problem is at hand. Now what happens is then organizations like 
what is the data security, whatever, the DSCA, with the gentleman was here, they are the lobbying groups which end up, I mean, earning crores of rupees in profit because now you have an industry which has suddenly created this whole problem. And this is a kind of system that constantly goes on. And these are certain aspects you will again have to look at it from a legal point of view. And you have to understand people like Kobe Alexander, who had to then run away from America, come from a security background because he was part of a unit of the Israeli army which was into communication intelligence. And many of the technologies they developed there, they used it as surveillance commercial for commercial purposes. And a whole lot of industry then becomes an entity in itself which keeps perpetuating this whole system of surveillance because it also translates into good business. So these are some of the issues that I leave behind to your thought. And maybe during question on the session, we'll be able to have a better discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saika. And uh, it was very interesting to follow up to uh, the laws and agencies overview that um, Sitarikan presented, uh, showing how sometimes laws are bad. Uh, for instance, how the, the Information Technology Act uh, has far lesser requirements for surveillance uh, under Section 69 and 69B than the Telegraph Act, which was drafted in 1885 uh, under Section 5.2 of the Telegraph Act. So uh, how we are actually sometimes progressing backwards in terms of law and how many times uh, those laws themselves are not observed. Uh, but you did leave one question unanswered, which I will try and come back to you with later, which was about how uh, even you seem to espouse the position that some amount of surveillance might actually be required for security, but technology might actually prevent that from happening if everyone uses end to end encryption. So, okay, uh, and he'll answer that. Now uh, I'll introduce uh, Maria Zinu, Sainu, who, uh, was, uh, who is right now uh, working with the Center for Internet and Society and was earlier with Privacy International. And and, and she's been doing some excellent uh, uh, work right now, uh, exposing the surveillance industry in India in a series of blog posts. And, and I really look forward to reading more of her posts on that. Thank you. I heard a lot about cybersecurity today. I'm assuming you all know what cybersecurity is. Uh, in the national, um, in the draft of national cybersecurity policy, cybersecurity it defines activity of protecting information, information systems. But protect, providing cybersecurity against what? Um, British Naya, a security expert, argued that um, cybersecurity uh, should provide it um, in cases of cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber crimes, and cyber vandalism. In particular, that crime um, today is in the, on a different domain, in the cyber domain. Uh, such as warfare in cyberspace, use of spy, uh, cyberspace to commit uh, terrorist attacks in the actual world, uh, crime in cyberspace, we're all familiar with, I'll move on. Um, today again, you heard about the draft national cybersecurity policy. I just wanted to point out three crucial points. Uh, the first one is that cybersecurity intelligence um, tries to anticipate attacks and in order to be able to provide counter-measures to them. Now what does it mean? In order to be able to anticipate attacks, that means they kind of have to do preventive surveillance in a way. It means that ultimately we're all been spied on, all our data's been monitored and intercepted uh, in order to be able to anticipate the, the possibility of us doing something illegal. Um, that means that surveillance is not provided as a security measure once uh, a crime has been committed, but it's actually on an, on an initial level, which is very concerning if we integrate on the first stage. The second one is um, effective correlation of information from multiple sources. Um, in order to be able to do this, well, this is basically referring to pattern matching. Um, collecting data on, collecting as much data as possible, the, the idea that seems to prevail in India and everywhere else in the world, is that, okay, we're gonna collect data for the sake of collecting data. Um, this data might, might not be used for right now, but in the future it will be, and while well, having this data, we'll be able to match everything together and somehow be able to detect the terrorists. The third one I think is the most important, it regards the sharing of information, especially with, in, uh, with international third parties. Generally, sharing information can be very concerning because the moment your information is shared with third parties, you don't control it. And generally, your data reflects your life, and he or she who controls your data controls your life. Ergo, when that data has been shared, 
they lose control of their own life. And what's been shared with international third parties is even a million times more concerning. Um, these were mentioned briefly by Saika. I'll just go if you heard about them today as well. Uh, so, monitoring any suspicious movements on the, on the internet. What does that even mean? How do we even define suspicious movement on the internet? Um, since there is no clarification on this, that means that literally anything you do can be considered suspicious, and there you go, uh oh, you're a terrorist, and well, too bad, I suppose. The CCTMS. Although I do understand that, yes, of course, sharing data among 14,000 police stations in India can be very useful. At the same time, we have a centralized database, um, which, again, we do not know how much is used. We do not know which agencies, in particular, will have access to it, what will be shared further on, and what kind of intelligence plan management will be done in the process. NAFRED is similar to this, only that this is an intelligence group which links the database of several departments and ministries. And as mentioned before, it, its aim is to create um, plans of intelligence. And this and all other schemes generally have uh, proliferated, or at least not proliferated, they have come to the surface right after the Mumbai terrorist attack. The central monitoring system, I will agree with Saiki sir, that yeah, it's not, it's not something new. Um, unfortunately, telecommunications and intercommunications have been surveilled for a really long time now. I would go as far as saying before 9-11, probably in most cases, as has been proven with the NSA in the US, for example. Uh, we do know this as a fact, the central monitoring system has started developing since 2009, so again, right after the Mumbai terrorist attacks although it, now it's been implemented. Now, why is this concerning? Because A, when you have a centralized monitoring system, that does mean that there is a probability that there can be more accuracy in, uh, not, not more accuracy, but it means that they can be more effective in detecting you in a way. However, that being said, generally speaking, the larger the database, the larger the probability for error, and given that the database on citizens in India is massive, again, the probability for error is huge, which again is very problematic, because that means that many innocent people can be convicted for something they did not do. Um, so now, uh, India. So this is a map from Privacy International. Uh, the reason why I put this is because cyber security, the security, uh, where, where this led to? This led to uh, an extensive surveillance in society, according to Privacy International. As you can see, the, the, the countries which are in black are endemic surveillance societies. So within these, we have the US, China, Russia, and among others. But India is, not very far away, and India is just next to the rank. <coughs> now why is that? Well, first of all, we have some very controversial laws in India. I won't refer to all of them because there's no time, but one of the most controversial is probably the Information Technology Act, which you're all familiar with. Section 44 imposes still penalties on anyone who fails to provide request information to authorities. Does this ring a bell? Does it ring, does this ring some kind of book? Does it remind you of some kind of political regime, perhaps? So no, it's up to you to decide. Section 66A, punishment for sending offensive messages through communication services. How do we even start to define offensive messages? What constitutes a, an offensive message? This vagueness of the section could potentially have anyone, anyone in this room, arrested for texting the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing online or any type of activity. And how, how is it possible that they will actually be able to know what you're doing online? Well, the central monitoring system is one of the systems which enables this. Section 69. Probably the most controversial uh, section of the law allows for interception of any information transmitted through a computer resource and requires the users to disclose encryption keys or, fail, or face a jail sentence of up to seven years. Disclosing encryption keys? So, if there's one way that we can actually ensure our privacy, so there's a, a lot of talk from intelligence agencies and governments that yes, we do support privacy, and it was very interesting um, in your speech before, Hermes, that you mentioned the reports of a group of experts on privacy and how you support privacy. How exactly are we supposed to uh, protect our privacy if we have to disclose, if we are required to disclose our encryption keys? How exactly are we, are we supposed to have private communications when laws like this actually exist? And then of course there's section 80, which allows, uh, which enables the disclosure of suspects in public places without a warrant. And Privacy International has pointed out that usually this takes place in cyber cafes where the majority of the internet users as, you, as we can understand, all the, all the previous uh, sections of the Information Technology Act can lead to major violations of human rights. Now, the surveillance industry. Why did I start looking at the surveillance industry? Well, who's aiding our watches? How are we watched to begin with? There has to be some kind of industry behind it, right? So WikiLeaks has done a fantastic job on this. Um, in the spy file, that they have loads of brochures on many surveillance technology companies operating all over the world. 
Um, in particular, in India, they have brochures for four companies, Clear Trail Technologies, Comlabs Design, Schultz and Security, and Shoei Communications. Uh, please feel free to go through the files and see more details on that. Um, so, given the, so the fact that there are currently brochures on four companies in India might be a bit misleading because it kind of creates the, the idea that there aren't, that it isn't a big cigarette industry in the country and thus cigarette may, not, may or may not be a big issue. So I started looking at some companies. Now please bear in mind that this is research in progress, so it's not complete and it may not be perfect. But so far, um, 76 companies have been verified to be operating in India and to be providing technology which can surveil. I think an interesting point is that not all these companies are surveillance technology companies per se. And also, I, I wouldn't like to use the, the term. I'd rather say companies producing surveillance technologies probably among other types of technologies. I think this is very interesting because if a country, for example, is selling other random types of products, it's, I suppose it's a good cover up for them selling spyware, for example, to law enforcement agencies. Um, this is the ISS world, probably the bigger surveillance trade show in the world. Um, they can have an idea of the location of where it's based usually. Uh, it hasn't been in India so far, but it's probably a matter of time. Uh, so on the data, uh, based on the data that I collected um, on the 76 companies, um, then you, can have, you can have a look at the amount of um, products sold, uh, products sold, different types of technologies from the 76 companies. So let's say like the kind of levels of internet monitoring, surveillance cameras, biometrics, feature analysis, phone monitoring, etc. Um, as you can see, the highest levels are biometrics, which is not really a surprise um, given UID schemes. So obviously, there has to be a lot of that. But uh, also keep in mind that this is not representative necessarily of the entire uh, level of surveillance within India because it's only based on 76 com uh, companies which are randomly selected. Now, like I mentioned, this is a part of ongoing research. So um, we have a database now of all the companies in India, IT companies. Within them, we have 2,000 companies most of which uh, we are assuming do produce surveillance technologies. Once we have completed that research on all the 2,000 companies, then we'll have a more um, clear picture of this. But for now, what we can see is that biometrics is very high, surveillance cameras too, um, CCTV, no surprise. Uh, but as for social network analysis, the levels are very low, but don't let that mislead you, because as you can see right next to it, data mining profiling is quite high. Again, this is a random sample, so um, it just so happens that probably very few of the random 76 companies happen to sell social network analysis. However, the interesting part of this is that when I had a chat with some people who um, sell this type of technology, they did confirm that this is used for the central monitoring system, which ultimately means that anything you do online, like on Facebook or any other social networking site, can be um, traced and well, plans can be made on that PC, risky profile um, in regards to other people. So from these companies, I selected some um, interesting did you know facts. Well, I don't know if they're interesting or something you can judge. The first one is uh, that WSS Security Solutions was the first company to install CCTV cameras in North India. So anyone here from North India? Okay, well now you know which company was the first one to install CCTV cameras in your region. The second one is uh, that Spec North, Systems... North India was only last place. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the region, let's say. But India in general is pretty large, so... Spec System Limited was the first Indian company to design and manufacture a micro UAV. UAV is unmanned aerial vehicles, as in drones, as in pilot uh, robots. Now, I'm, not, I'm not implying this specific UAV is supplied by Spec Systems. Unfortunately, they don't have any pictures of the type of UAV, so it's not very clear what type of UAVs they, they produce. But it, I suppose it is possible that it could be something as small as, as that. It could be something as big as my palm or anything, even though it's a micro UAV. Um, again, Given the fact that such technologies are not regulated currently in India, this raises major concerns into how they're used, for what purposes, uh, who has access to their data, etc., etc. Mobile well, Spy India. Now, why is this very interesting? This is very interesting because, well, generally speaking, a lot of people in India argue that privacy and surveillance is an elitist issue and that it doesn't concern the majority of the population. However, I really disagree with this notion because around 75% of the population do have mobile phones. And while they do have mobile phones, we, there are also a lot of companies like Mobile Spy, which provide the kind of technology to be able to censor everything you say or don't say on the phone. Like, for example, um, some features include Sniper Spy, being able to remotely monitor smartphones or computers from any location. Mobile Spy is able to monitor up to three phones and upload SMS data without leaving traces. Now, I think the, the, the fact that there's only traces is, a, is very concerning. InfoSo. 
one of the many, many companies operating in India which um, provide internet monitoring um, technology, which sell internet monitoring technology. Um, basically what this does is intelligence gathering for an entire state or a region, and it creates a chain of suspects from a single starting point. So for example, if, um, if I were using this technology and you, for example, um, happen to, I don't know, be from North India, from, I don't know, from a specific area in North India, our edge, whatever, and so on, 